Hello, everybody. Welcome back. In the last video, we looked at a two time step transition probability. The probability that we went to some state at time two, given we started at some state at time zero and we completely bypassed the time or the state of the chain at time one. It kind of looked to us like matrix multiplication. And in this video, we're going to prove that that is the case. Okay, so before we get going, I first wanted to take a moment to talk about the Markov property again and why it might be a little bit more than you think it is. I don't really know what you're thinking, but I think it's more than some people think it is. So we defined it by looking at a conditional probability such as this one, the probability that x3 equals 2, given x2 equals 5 and x1 is 4 and x0 is 3. The Markov property says that only the most recent piece of information matters and we can drop what's going on at times one and zero. But did you know only the most recent piece of information matters, even if you're skipping time steps? So what I'm trying to say is the probability that x3 equals two, given x1 equals four and x0 equals three. Now we're missing what's going on at time two, but this is going to be by the Markov property, the probability that x3 equals two, given the most recent piece of information in the time sequence. And that most recent piece of information is what is going on at time one. So it's okay that we never knew what happened at time two. Let's prove it. I'm going to start with the left hand side of my claim. Now, as I said, there's no time two here, but let's put it in. I am going to change this probability for x3 alone living in this conditional space to a joint probability for x3 and x2. I'm going to let x2 be i and I'm going to sum over all possible i in the state space. When I sum that, I will get back down to the marginal probability for x3 living in this conditional land. Now I'm going to write this intersecting probability as a conditional probability times a marginal. And I'm going to do that in conditional land. So I'm going to keep the stuff that's on the right side of the conditional line there at all times. So we're going to write this as the probability that x3 is 2, given that x2 equals i and that x1 equals 4 and x0 equals 3, times the probability that x2 equals i, given x1 equals 4 and x0 equals 3. By the Markov property, I get to drop this one, this one, and this one, and I do, and we end up with this, the sum over all i in the state space of the probability that x3 equals 2 given x2 equals i times the probability that x2 equals i given x1 equals 4. So I want you to remember this line, take a screenshot, write it down, or just remember it. I'll stall a little bit here. Remember, what we're trying to show is this conditional probability up here is equal to just this part, and it doesn't matter that we don't have the value at time two. And so I worked out this expression here, and rather than take it further and go forward to try to get where we're trying to go, I am going to start with the other side of what we're trying to prove. I'm going to look at just this conditional probability here, and we're going to get the exact same expression. So we will have proven the point that this is equal to this. Let's look at the smaller conditional probability that x3 equals 2 given x1 equals 4. I'm going to do the same thing. I am going to bring in the value of x2. I'm going to let it be i and I'm going to sum over all i in the state space. And then I'm going to write this intersection probability as a conditional times a marginal while living in the conditional land where x1 is always equal to 4. Now, by the Markov property, I get to drop this one. And now we have the exact same expression that we had on the previous slide. So on the previous slide, we worked out the probability that x3 equals 2, given the value that x1 equals 4 and x0 equals 3. And we got this. And now we worked out the probability that x3 equals 2, given that x1 equals 4. And we ignored the x0. And we got the same exact expression. So we have shown this. In other words, the Markov property, 
It doesn't matter if some values are missing. If you have some kind of history of the process given to you, then the only relevant piece of information is the most recent time step that has been given. And now for the main course, what you really came here to see are the chapman kolmogorov equations. That is, you came here to see that powers of a matrix can give you multi-step transition probabilities. So before we can do that, a little notation. Before we let lowercase p sub ij denote the probability of moving from i to j in one time step. And now we're gonna let p sub ij raised to the, it's not a power, so a superscript, an n in parentheses. Now the reason it's in parentheses is so it doesn't look like an nth power. And this is going to represent the probability of going from i to j in n time steps. Remember, we're always assuming time homogeneity of our Markov chain unless explicitly stated otherwise. So this is the probability you go from i to j between times m and m plus n, but it's also the probability you go from i to j between time zero and time n. Just like we organized our original transition probabilities into a transition probability matrix, we are going to organize these n-step transition probabilities into an n-step transition probability matrix. I am gonna call that this bold-faced P and then super n in parentheses, so that's not a power that is notation for a matrix filled with n-step transition probabilities. In particular, the ij entry is going to be the probability of moving from state i to state j in n steps with our Markov chain. Okay, so we're ready to prove the chapman kolmogorov equations. Now there's more than one way to write this down. This happens to be my favorite way. And what this is saying is, the probability that we go from some state i to some state j in n plus m time steps can be written as the sum over all states k of the probability of going from i to k in the first m time steps and then the probability of going from k to j in the remaining n time steps. Now m and n here can be any positive integer and they can even be zero. So what does it mean to go from i to j in zero time steps? you can't move in zero time steps. So you're not going anywhere starting at i, but if j is equal to i, then starting at i in zero time steps, you're still at i. So we can say the probability of going from i to j in zero time steps is one if j is equal to i, and it's zero if j is not equal to i because there's zero time steps and you're not able to move away from i. The product in here, comes from the Markov property, because if you imagine starting at time zero at some state i and moving in m units of time to some intermediate state k, where you go next only depends on starting at k and the rest of the path is independent of what happened back here, conditional on you knowing that one value. So we sort of see that independence in the product of the probabilities here. And again, we need to sum over all possible stopping points at time m, all possible states that we can possibly be in at time m. So starting with the left-hand side, the probability of moving from i to j in m plus n time steps, this is just another notation for the probability that at time n plus m we're in state j, given at time zero we were in state i. In the earlier slides in this video, I brought in another random variable. I want to bring in here where we are at time m, and I'm gonna let that be state k, and I'm gonna run over or sum over all of the states k. So I can do that by rewriting this probability as an intersection in conditional land, and then rewriting that intersection as a conditional times a marginal in conditional land. But we can go straight there, given that you're convinced that this now works, and remember, in our intro uh, videos, we called this conditioning on the random variable at time m. So this probability is equal to the sum over all k in the state space of the probability that x at time n plus m equals j, given x at time m is equal to k, and x at time 0 equals i, times the probability that x at time m equals k, given x at time 0 equals i. By the Markov property, I get to drop this one. 
And now we have exactly a transition probability taking us from K to J. And over here, we have an M step transition probability taking us from I to K. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. Let's learn about the letter N. They're in the reverse order, but these are just scalar. N these are scalars, right? is a letter. That's exactly what we wanted to show. I mean, they're in the wrong order, but these are just scalars, right? They're commutative. So really, it is what we wanted to show. Here's another way to write the chapman kolmogorov equations that I feel like is a little clumsy, but uh, you may need this characterization. And that is to let n be any non-negative integer and then let m not be any non-negative integer, but be either 0, 1, 2, 3, up to n. We can talk about the probability of going from i to j in n time steps by looking at where we are at an intermediate time step m and then going the rest of the way. So this is going to be the sum over all states k in the state space. We're going to go from i to k in the first m steps. Now m is in by design here, supposed to be less than n. And then we're going to go from k to j in the remaining n minus m time steps. And remember, it is OK if n equals m because we've talked about the transition probabilities in zero time steps. They make sense. So we would prove this in a very similar way. So I'm going to spare you. It's it's very similar. You might want to try it yourself. But what do we know? We have shown, so I'm going back to my first chapman kolmogorov equation, the probability of going from ij and n plus m time steps. We've written it as this sum. Now, this first probability over here, this is the ij entry of the n plus m step transition matrix. This probability over here is the ik entry of the n step transition probability matrix. And this probability over here is the kj entry of the m step transition probability matrix. So what we're seeing is the ij entry of one matrix comes from looking at everything in the ith row of this matrix and everything in the g eighth column of this matrix all multiplied individually and summed. And that is matrix multiplication. In other words, we have just proven that the n plus m step transition matrix can be written as a product of the n step transition matrix times the m step transition matrix. These are not scalars, these are matrices. And as you know, matrix multiplication is not commutative necessarily, but it is in this case. Remember how we proved chapman kolmogorov We decided to condition on where we were after the first m steps of time. And we could have conditioned on where we were after the first n steps of time. And we could have written down the chapman kolmogorov equations with the n and the m on the right-hand side in the opposite positions. So that means we also know that the n plus m step transition matrix can be written as the m step transition matrix times the n step transition matrix. So that means that all of these are the same. So these guys actually do commute. Note that P super N in parentheses is the matrix full of N step transition probabilities. So P super one in parentheses is the matrix full of one step transition probabilities. And that's just our original transition probability matrix P. Also, Note that the matrix filled with zero step transition probabilities is the identity matrix. So this is the matrix with ones on the diagonals and zero everywhere else, because I can go from, for example, state one to state one in zero time steps. I do that with probability one. And similarly, I can go from state five to state five in zero time steps. And I do that with probability one, but I can't move from five to any other state so all the probabilities off the diagonal are zero. So we get an identity matrix, which may be infinite dimensional. This is going to have the dimension of the state space in the number of rows and the number of columns. So check this out. Let's look at the two-step transition probability matrix. By the chapman kolmogorov equations, we know that we can write this as the one-step transition probability matrix times the one-step transition probability matrix. But we just said, that this is our original matrix P without any sort of superscript. 
And so now I have matrix P times the matrix P, P squared. So we now know that the two-step transition probability matrix is the original transition probability matrix squared. Similarly, let's look at the three-step transition probability matrix. There's a couple of ways to rewrite this. One way would be to take the two-step transition probability matrix times the one-step matrix. So that is what's given by Chapman, Coleman, Goroff. Now we've just seen here that the two-step matrix is the original matrix squared. And we do know that the one-step matrix is the original matrix. So we've got the matrix squared times the matrix, and that's the matrix cubed. So the matrix filled with three-step transition probabilities is equal to the one-step transition probability matrix cubed, and so on. So in general, the matrix filled with n-step transition probabilities is the original one-step matrix to the nth power. But keep in mind, the probability, so this is a lowercase p, the probability of going from i to j in n steps is not equal to the probability of going from i to j raised to the nth power. And that, that would be saying that when you multiply the matrix, the matrix, when you took like n powers of the matrix, you would be taking the nth power of each entry. And matrix multiplication just doesn't work that way. So while we do have equality for the matrices in terms of n step and the powers of the matrix, we do not have that same equality when we're looking at individual probabilities of moving from a state I to a state J. As a quick example, let's revisit the one from the previous video where we had a ridiculously oversimplified weather model. It was sunny or rainy on any given day, and we assumed that the weather followed a Markov chain with this transition matrix. So if you want to find the probability, for example, that X7 is sunny, given that X2 is rainy, this is five time steps, and we're going from rainy to sunny. So we need the five step transition probability matrix, and we're going to go in there and pull out the rainy to sunny entry. But we've just proven that the five step transition probability matrix is the original matrix to the fifth power. So here it is to the fifth power. And if I go in and grab the rainy to sunny entry, I get approximately 0.58125. So that's the answer. And it was a lot easier than going through and conditioning on what was happening at times three, four, five, and six. In our next video, we're gonna talk about absorbing states for a Markov chain. These are states that suck you in. And once you hit them, when you're traveling around the state space, you can never get away. It's just as cool as it sounds. I will see you in the next one.